Welcome back. And today we've uh, got Janet Morgan again talking about neurodiversity, which is a main area of expertise and practice. And today what we're going to do is have a look at the issue about neurodiversity being included in the whole kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or EDI, DEI, however you want to put it, or, and I'm seeing EDI B now blogging being added to the end and some of the variations of that. And really that within organizations, quite often DEI, I think, gets more airtime than neurodiversity. And we're just going to talk about that. And I'm going to share some interesting pieces of recent research. Welcome back, Janet. Thanks, David. As always, it's good to be here. Yeah, that's cool. Where are you in terms of your thoughts about neurodiversity being part of DEI landscape and particularly within organizations that organizations are thinking about neurodiversity when they're thinking about uh, DEI issues? I, I guess there's a couple of ways to think about that. There's in the very overt way that we have this emerging profession under HR, if you like, or DEI, EDI. And, and the various other iterations, professionals who have a set of competencies or are developing a set of competencies, it's very early on. And as part of that conversation now, what coming up is this conversation around, as you were saying, belonging and inclusion, what that looks like. And so groups who have felt that they've not been included in the historical conversations and we might want to talk about the protected characteristics, but I, I think a lot of people think there are the usual suspects in terms of things like race and gender mainly. And through the activism and advocacy of lots of people, there is now an emerging group of people who are saying, this is something that speaks to us. This is where we don't feel that we are experiencing equity in the workplace. And I guess organizations have been trying to respond to that under the umbrella of EDI, DEI, and so on. And neurodiversity falls within that, I guess. Um, and I see lots of positives with that in that it's given voice to a lot of people who have been voiceless for a long time. I think there are some caveats that come with that as well, because it's a complex terrain. So if we stick with the positive for a moment, as I say, it shined a light, I guess, on organizations holding the mirror up to themselves. And if we understand neurodiversity as something that involves everybody, but in our traditional ways of thinking about how we process information, how we learn, how we problem solve, that's been skewed towards a particular way of thinking and processing information. And that has ended up marginalizing people who identify as neurodistinct, neurodivergent, neurospicy, and all of these other derivatives. DEI, I think in some ways, is trying to learn, learn some of the lessons from what's happened with race and gender. In some ways, I think one of the things that is a bit of a concern is that often new areas of identity and new areas of marginalization become the new gender or the new race or the new black. And you see some of that in the way the narrative is playing out in terms of neurodiversity. So I think it's important to be mindful of that, but certainly for large organizations, they have given it due attention and are putting a lot of things in place now that I see in terms of systems and processes. Smaller organizations, I think it's a bit harder. There are issues around resources that people are concerned about. That doesn't have to be the case, but certainly that's what people's thinking is. As ever, the answer is 42, it depends, but it would be wrong and disingenuous to say that there hasn't been a lot more attention, as there rightly should be, to neurodiversity. That's a good thing. As we always say, there's a lot to do. Yeah. And, and is there a possibility that if, it's, if neurodiversity in particular is included in the, the general DI, that it, there's a loss of focus? Is that a worry? Well, I think, and I think that could be true, certainly true of neurodiversity and true, most people would argue, of, of, of any area. But yes, I think there can be a loss of focus, particularly because we are talking about something that's often hidden 
or invisible. I know some people don't like the term hidden because it suggests that people are hiding, but something that can feel very intangible in a workplace. So again, it can end up getting lost in a wider DEI discussion. Also, it depends on where DEI sits within the organization. If it is a function within an organization that's lower down strategically, then neurodiversity will get lost in that. It may, you end up with doing something in an awareness week, you might do a little bit of training. And then once that's happened, it's gone and then it disappears. So I think it is vulnerable to actually being swallowed up in wider discussions around DEI. And of course, that has huge implications for people who find themselves in the neuro minority in workplaces. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's, it's also interesting that there's a number of research papers coming out talking about this very issue. There was one published two years ago, 2022, looking at this. So from a medical point of view, there's a journal called Biological Psychiatry and so neurodiversity is considered to be, from a medical point of view, biological psychiatry. And looking at, so the journal's called Biological Psychiatry, Cognitive Neuroscience and Neuroimaging. And there was an, a really interesting article in there, putting an argument forward that DI really needs to expand to include neurodiversity. And it comes up with a, a range of kind of recommendations and reasons for doing this. And some of those are very much some of the issues that you've raised in previous podcasts, and I'm sure we'll cover again in, in other podcasts around things like, so the recommendations of the paper was that by including it in the general DI landscape within organizations, is it helps to cultivate a greater humility about biological psych psychiatry, about neurodiversity. And the practices that are involved in there from a kind of a leadership and a management and also an organizational point of view, and that it helps to resist the assumptions that uh, tend to occur around neurodiversity about what is normal functioning and the idea that if you deviate from normal functioning, whatever your thing is, is that it needs to be cured or somehow dealt with in, in some way. And the paper and the whole medical side of this, the, the, the psychiatric, the biological psychiatry is behind this idea of recognizing and acknowledging quite all of this. They are not temporary things. You're not going to cure them. They are part of a person. And there's a wide latitude of those, which we've talked about and that needs to be understood within organizations and also honoring the choice of neurodiverse individuals within organizations and, and treating them with respect and allowing them autonomy within the workplace rather than treating them as, you know, not only is this person not normal, we're not going to treat them as in any way where they can feel normal either. And which actually links to a paper that was um, published last year, there's a whole load of really interesting research coming out of a place called the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. And what this paper did, last, so this was late last year, is that they were looking at burnout with neurodiverse people and the impact of trying to work in organizations and trying to navigate the systems and because there are the the right mechanisms, the organization really doesn't understand what they're doing and that there are high levels of burnout amongst neurodiverse individuals as well. And I think that's, these are really important reasons for including it in a way so it doesn't get lost. I agree. And, and there's lots to unpack in what you said there, David. Um, firstly, it's, it's interesting that the research that you're drawing from is, is come from medicine. Um, and there's a contrast with that medical model that historically has been in place where neurodiversity, we weren't always using that term, but neurodiversity was seen as something that needed to be cured. So it was framed as there is something wrong. And so the medical profession is also rethinking, holding the mirror up to itself, being 
challenged on some of those historical framings and how the research came out about neurodiversity. So I think there is a responsibility to lead the way and provide the information that organizations need to translate that into behavior in the workplace and workplace cultures. And of course, that's going to be complex because neurodivergent people are individual. And for some people, they may not need any recommendations at all other than some technology. And for other people, they may require something else or they might require something that's far more personalized. And organizations need to be fluid and adaptive enough to think about neurodiversity in a far more agile way and think about moving from that medicalization to not that someone needs to be cured, but actually workplaces that are inclusive, that do make people belong, have to be mature enough and should be mature enough to actually look at what they might be doing to put barriers in the way of people. And as you say, we've spoken about what some of those things would look like. And the agency of the individual employee is important in all of that. So some people will know exactly what they need in order to thrive in the workplace. Other people may not because the workplace has not felt very inclusive. And so I think the more that we can learn those insights from neuroscience and from the journals that you're referring to there, the more that we can translate that into organizational cultures to recognize the fact that actually people are feeling marginalized. People are not necessarily going to go forward for promotion. They may not be considered for promotion because this idea of what the norm looks like at a leadership level will not apply to them. So I think it, it's making that stuff meaningful in a tangible way for the current leadership and also ensuring that individuals can be agentic in the workplace. So that lived experience, that lived reality um, meets with what's happening in the leadership so we can think about the organizational change that we need. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the way that this can be achieved so that, and it's not just about the organization. So there's a number of papers saying, look, policies need to change and, and For sure. organizations really need to rethink like how they're conceptualizing normality and diversity within that. And that's fine because that's just structural level and you can mm -hmm. put policies out and things. But my question is, how? what are the mechanisms where that kind of change can take place within organizations? I think for me, as somebody who goes in and supports people in organizations, what I often see is the vulnerability of leaders and managers who don't really understand what we're talking about in terms of neurodiversity. There is that protective hesitation. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to say anything that is going to offend people. So I'm not going to say anything and I'm not going to do anything. At the very sort of base level in terms of communication, we need to be able to have better conversations about neurodiversity. In a way, we talk a lot about psychological safety now, but productive, empathic conversations about neurodiversity. And I think we need to ensure the throughput of that conversation. So you don't want to just have a conversation and it stops. You will have people around you already who are neurodivergent, neurodiverse, what, whatever term you need. And perhaps the starting conversation is wrapping your head around the language and the terminology, because that's very difficult for people to grapple with. But actually that's a normal part of human evolution. Language lives and it changes and it evolves. Having a, a conversation about that will help better communication around neurodiversity that speaks to some of the myths and the mythologies and, and, and just unpacks some of those things is going to be helpful. And I guess what I'm saying is that this is going to require, these mechanisms are happening on different fronts. So there are a lot of people, and you mentioned burnout, there are a lot of people who are already experiencing burnout. So whilst this is taking place and while people are becoming more aware who might identify as neurotypical, it's also, what are we doing to support our colleagues who are already experiencing that burnout because they are in workplaces where they can't thrive because of the way that they're set up? How can they have those conversations without having to bear the emotional burden of all of that? So I think the communication piece is an important one. That structural piece is absolutely really important, but pushing, just pushing beyond the good intent 
I think is the mechanism for that. There is enough information now, thankfully, for people to um, realize that we're not talking about um, a group of people who are deficit in some kind of way. That information has already been there. But I think now if, if anybody um, was to try and subscribe to that, I think that they would see the consequences of that pretty quickly. So we've moved on um, in that thinking. But I think, as you say, the how, I think a lot of people are worried about cost. A lot of people are worried about the communication, the comms around all of that. A lot of people are concerned about the what about tree. So what about this group and what about that group? But neurodiversity cuts across everybody. And yeah. so it's, there's real value in organizations opening themselves up to have a nuanced conversation about the beauty of the way that we as human beings all think and learn differently and what we are going to, what assets we're going to get when we actually shine a spotlight on people who do things differently. What are the types of different conversations that we're going to have? What are the things that we're going to learn? What are the innovations that we're going to make? What are we going to learn about other aspects of inclusion from neurodiversity? I'm very clear that you need to focus on particular groups, especially if your data is telling you that something's going wrong. But it's always about seeing the connections and the fluidity. And neurodiversity, as I say, is everybody. It's all of us. We're all on that spectrum somewhere. And some of us may move across that spectrum more than others. And some of us may find ourselves in one place a bit more than others. That's a fascinating opportunity to think about what you can do as an organization. So if we can get to the point where we really see the value of that conversation and changing a way of working, then that opens up more possibilities. And as idealistic as that sounds, um, you're not going to force people into thinking more inclusively. You can certainly have mechanisms in place to hold people accountable, but far better to have productive conversations that lead to productive outcomes, I think. Yeah, I have a load of questions around all of that. The first question, I suppose, is, a, I don't know, a challenge in as much as you say we've moved on from the, the old medical model. I just wonder how much, I say society, that's a big term, how much people really have moved on, how, like, when you go into organizations, like, do people, have people gen, genuinely and generally moved on, or is there still a piece to do around this of these people aren't broken? I, I accept that challenge, and it's, it's a fair challenge because those of us who work in this space can be in a bit of a bubble sometimes. So I do see some of the progress, but equally, I also do see colleagues, as I say, as a coach or working in consultancy who are finding themselves being performance managed out of organizations who are experiencing that burnout, who do not feel that they can disclose, who are getting mixed messages from organizations, which is that, yes, we believe in inclusion and we give interview questions up front and we do all of this stuff, but ultimately it somehow falls apart when you're in there. So I'm certainly not saying that we're at nirvana yet. And, and when I say moved on, <laughs> everything is relative. And so if we're thinking about the dial, yes, the dial has had it shifted, but I absolutely recognize that there is a huge way to go in really for, for us really to be thinking about neurodiversity in the way that we should be. And of course, it's contextual. The organizations where I have seen the most progress in some respects are larger and make a lot of noise about it. That's not to say that smaller organizations aren't doing things, but I do see when the conversation becomes about resources and money and time, I think that there are a lot of SMEs, for example, who just think we're stuck. And indeed, I've had people coming to me saying, look, we've got a great colleague. We really want to hold on to them. We just don't know what to do. We don't have an HR. We buy in our HR. We don't have these policies and procedures. And what do we do? So, yeah, I would agree that there's a lot of work to do in those respects. Okay, great. And, and 
I suppose the next question is, and this is right in your kind of area, what is it that brings organizations to you? What are the, what, why do they start engaging with neurodiversity when there's lots of other things to be thinking about when you're running a business or an organization? To be frank, a lot of the time it is usually when something's gone wrong. So there is usually a performance issue and it can be a last chance saloon situation where organizations, and I'm, I'm starting with the bad news first, but when organizations have pretty much got to that point where they're saying this is not going to work out and they are trying to coach the person out of the organization and want to be seen, if I'm honest, there are organizations want to be seen to have done everything, ticked all the boxes. We can say that happens. That's a reality. Equally, the scenario that I've just described through my own networks and contacts, people will have a colleague and something's just not quite right. And they've grabbed snippets of information from places. Sometimes they may themselves, as managers with families, they've got some divergence within their own circles and their networks, and they're suddenly thinking, could there possibly be something going on there? So you, you have those individual pieces where people will reach out and say, I'm seeing something here. Can you come in and help us? And then there are organizations who will tap into the wider recognition society-wise that we're now talking about neurodiversity. And so we, where we have things like Neurodiversity Celebration Week, they will reach out and say, this is something we don't know too much about. They will reach out that way. Or sometimes you'll have an editorial piece where you'll see something that's written about in terms of neurodiversity. I know when the piece came out about MI5 recruiting a lot of people, then there was suddenly it was like, oh, okay, there might be something in this or reports about competitive advantage. So there's a number of different ways and what is happening now increasingly as we're hearing the lived experience and we're hearing more sort of celebrities who are talking about neurodivergence. This is happening in ADHD particularly at the moment, um, but also in autism and it, dis historically with uh, dyslexia. Organizations are suddenly going, hang on a minute, it might be useful to explore this. And I guess the last point is what you said before, the well-being piece and the intersection between neurodiversity and well-being. So I think a lot of people are actually housing neurodiversity under well-being. It's interesting, was very much used to sit within disability services. And now what I am seeing with organizations is they are coming at it from a well-being perspective. And so they're looking for people who have got some insight and some expertise because it often isn't in-house. I guess that's the main point. Yes. It often isn't in-house. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And it's a very specialist area. And as you've been showing on the podcast so far, um, there are so many factors that are involved in this um, that it's be rare for somebody, say, within HR or something to have their fingers on all of that. And it's about bringing in the expertise for, for what's needed and, and somebody who's up to date with the research understands what's going on in the field. And that's not too easy to keep up with either. So in the next podcast, what we're going to be having a look at is the factors which help neurodistinct employees take on an active role within organizations. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thanks, Janet. Bye.